let's uh, also understand uh, some key highlights of Covera's Hindsight 2020 report as well. Uh, it essentially highlights the average portfolio has nine schemes. More women have started investing. More investors are now investing via direct plans. The average SIP size is also back to pre-COVID levels. So there are a host of ex interesting and intriguing uh, highlights of this report. Let's touch base with Nilab Sanyal, the co-founder and COO of Kuvera. Hi, Mr. Sanyal. Thank you so much for taking time out. As an investor, wealth manager, and a personal finance advisor, since so many years you've experienced so many milestones in the markets, let me first start by addressing today's momentous occasion. How have they helped the average Indian create wealth? Uh, well, let me put it this way. Uh, I started my journey in the, in the financial markets when uh, the Sensex was at around 3K. Uh, and in just a span of 20 years, we are now looking at uh, a 50k sensex. So, uh, and of course, you know, the, the, there are many, many milestones. But the key learnings for for uh, me as an investor, as an advisor, uh, uh, have been that you know, if you have surpluses, then you should deploy them in the market till the time you don't need the money. Don't take uh, money out of the market. Uh, that is one one key learning. Uh, the second is that uh, as a retail investor, if we do not have the expertise, uh, and arguably uh, none of us do, to predict what the markets are going to do uh, in the near future or in the uh, you know medium term or even in the long term. So one should not try to uh, time the market uh, and follow that simple principle. If there is a surplus, then try to deploy it uh, productively. Uh, uh, the, the third uh, part is avoid uh, sector specific uh, investing, especially if you do not have the expertise, if you do not, uh, you know, if you are not doing this full time, investing is not a full time profession, then it is preferable to use the mutual funds route to invest. Uh, and the most and the last most important thing is time in the market is key as a retail investor. Uh, typically what uh, we have observed uh, across multiple cycles is that as a retail investor, we, you know, sort of enter the market when markets are peaking. And uh, we tend to take money out of the market when markets start correcting out of a fear that we are going to lose more money. In effect, we are, you know, uh, sort of making the wrong decision at both the peak and the trough of the market. So, uh, again, you know, all of this simply, you know, can be rolled into one uh, factor that as a retail investor, we shouldn't try to time the market and deploy our surpluses productively when we have them and take money of the off the market or out of our investments only when we need them. So these, I think, would be the three key, uh, three or four key, uh, you know, observations or learnings that have worked across, uh, you know, the milestones uh, that, that we have seen so far. What is your sense on uh, investors who are who, who've parked their money for the long haul? Why should they stay put even now? Well, this is you know this is a very very regular question every year. Uh, you know, if you see every year, markets would give an opportunity at the between the lowest and the peak of the markets. Every in every year, there is an opportunity to make a twenty percent uh, plus return because uh, you know. If you are able to identify that today is the lowest uh, day, uh, you know, in the market, and uh, X Y Z date is the, uh, you know, when the market has peaked, and if you are able to, uh, you know, buy and sell accordingly, uh, then there is a twenty percent chance. But unfortunately, uh, the chance of making a twenty percent return. But unfortunately, none of us have that capability to be able to predict that market. Uh, we stand at that same, uh, you know, sort of point today, where. You know, is fifty thousand uh, uh, a point where the markets have peaked? Will there be a correction? Uh, maybe there are some indications that there will be a correction, but how long will will that correction be? How deep will that correction be? We don't know. And uh, uh, you know, 
what when will the you know when will the next wave resume we are unable to predict so it is better rather than you know trying to time the market and understand uh, you know sort of uh, uh, identify these highs and lows of the market it's better to continue to staying invested because you know like i said i mean if you look at a 20 year journey from 3k to 50k uh, there obviously have been uh, occasions when the markets have given 50%, 60% negative returns as well. But if you have stayed invested across these cycles, the, your return profile would have been uh, would have been far more smoother. And hence, uh, it's not a question of staying put. It's more a question of sticking uh, to your investment plan, uh, building a you know a portfolio which is suitable for your long-term investment goal and sticking to that uh, you know, plan whether the market is at fifty thousand or a different number. I mean, finally, fifty thousand is just a number. Okay, let's talk about the hindsight report as well. One of the lessons you mentioned in the report uh, is that one must realize long-term capital gains of up to one lakh when one gets the chance. So, do you think Sensex at 50k is one such occasion where mutual fund investors perhaps should look at booking profits? Yes. So, the, see, the idea is not to exit uh, the market. When you're when we are talking about uh, tax loss harvesting, and, and that is what you are referring to, effectively, what that means is you are able to capture uh, up to one lakh long-term capital gains. Because that is, you know, and the gains that you make, there will be no tax on that, and gains beyond one lakh will be taxed at about ten percent. So uh, you are effectively saving a ten thousand rupee tax by booking that one lakh rupee gain. You can continue to basically you are repricing your portfolio, so you can exit from that uh, security and reinvest into the same. And uh, if your you know uh, overall long term capital gains is around one lakh, then you sh you can look at booking that profit now and reinvesting in that same security, in that same mutual fund scheme. Okay. Many individuals have had to either trim or pause their SIPs. Uh, what has been the most common reasons and which of them was perhaps an incorrect rationale that you would like to flag off to our viewers as well for future reference? See, I think uh, this was a this was a very interesting uh, you know survey. About uh, thirty percent of the users said that you know they have temporarily paused uh, their SIPs and they would you know sort of they would resume those SIPs after a couple of months. Uh, another thirty percent, which was probably unavoidable for them, said that they were going through a financial crunch, maybe due to a you know job loss or due to a medical emergency. Uh, because of which they were going to stop their SIPs and maybe even you know uh, withdraw from funds from the market. Uh, this is probably an unavoidable reason. Uh, another set and about you know this is about 15% uh, across three of the reasons where people said that you know they are stopping because uh, they are moving to a, a lump sum based investing where they would see the market and then invest rather than you know invest on specific dates. Uh, or uh, uh, you know they are changing their they are modifying their portfolio because of the way markets have uh, uh, changed, and another fifteen percent were plain and simple. They were spooked by the way the markets were behaving and by seeing the volatility, they wanted to take money off the table. Uh, I think except for financial crunch where there is an actual need of funds, uh, if you are changing your investment plan or if you're changing your, uh, you know, uh, withdrawing from the market only because of the direction in which the markets are moving, then all of these are probably reasons which are invalid or, you know, you should rethink uh, that. And then, uh, you know, especially because all of these other reasons indicate that uh, the investor is trying to time the market and bringing far more emotion uh, to investing rather than use the disciplined approach to investing. So, you know, to answer your question another way, probably only 30% of the investors who we surveyed actually had a genuine reason to stop their SIPs, while all the others, uh, it was more of a, you know, emotional reason to stop their uh, SIPs and move away from their investment plan. Okay. But for those who have been able to overcome the financial hurdles, do you think SIPs should be resumed immediately? 
Yes, absolutely. And, uh, you know, think of it this way, that if we have surpluses, uh, whether they are, uh, you know, short term or long term, then we should look to deploy them in the market as soon as possible. Uh, because finally, what do you want with your funds uh, rather than letting them sit idle? Uh, you want time in the market with your money. And if you have a long-term investment horizon and if you have a, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, do not have immediate need for that funds, then you should look at deploying them uh, by way of an SIP. And, uh, you know, given that our, uh, you know, probably 60-70% of users who are uh, salaried who are deploying their uh, wealth through SIPs, uh, their cash flow profile is also where, you know, you get monthly uh, surpluses, you have monthly uh, salary payments, and therefore, you should try to deploy them as soon as you have the money in your bank account. So, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, rather than pause your SIP or rather than try to time the market, stay in the market, stick to your plan and continue your SIPs. If you stop them, uh, there's nothing wrong in going and right away and uh, you know restarting your SIPs. Okay, Mr. Sanya, we would like to keep this conversation going, but unfortunately, stopping here for a break. Please stay on with us. We'll uh, take it on uh, from here when we come back. Welcome back, you're still watching The Money Show and we're in conversation with Nilab Sanyal of Covera. Nilab, uh, just to sort of pick it up from where we left off, you mentioned quite a few funds in the most watched list as well. Many of them have small AUMs, PGIM, Global Equity, Tata, Digital India. Can you tell us what's the buzz around them? Uh, well, if you look at the you know specific construct of these funds, uh, given the way US markets uh, have done. There has been a, a you know lot of interest in investing internationally. Uh, mutual funds do remain the preferred vehicle for retail investors to access international markets. And uh, PGM Global Equity, in a sense, gives uh, provides investors that access. Uh, that's for PGM Global Equity. As far as uh, Tata Digital, it's in the technology space. We have seen uh, you know I think after pharma, probably tech is the uh, next sector which has rallied significantly. Uh, Tata Digital India Fund is uh, again being one of the most watch listed stocks for that very reason. Okay. Okay. Um, you mentioned the, the, that timing the market is hard so one should buy when they have cash and sell when they need. How does this tie in with the global goal-based objective as well? Shouldn't investors sell closer to their goals? Yes, absolutely. And uh, you know the the way to do this is, uh, let's say you have a ten-year investment horizon, and uh, you know closer as you start in uh, and you are starting to invest today. Uh, over the first, let's say you know uh, six to seven years, you continue to have the asset allocation largely into equity. And as you are nearing your goal, which means, let's say, you know, uh, seven years from now, you'll be three years away from the goal. You have to start de-risking your portfolio, uh, uh, which would effectively mean that you would rebalance out of equity into debt. So let's say, you know, your your uh, ideal asset allocation was 80-20 starting out. Uh, then in year seven, you could probably uh, look to rebalance, you know, sell some of that equity and move into uh, debt such that by the time you are ready to, uh, you know, when, when your goal uh, is maturing, at that point of time, your entire investment is into uh, low-risk debt instruments. So, uh, it's it's effectively, you know, the, the same, uh, it's effectively the same concept uh, because fundamentally what defines your uh, goal is what is the investment horizon that you have and what is the amount uh, that you think that you will need to meet your financial goal. And this is the time part of it. So when you are investing uh, for the long term, you're effectively, uh, you don't need that cash or you don't need that money for that period. So you stay investing, invested during that period. And as you near uh, your goal maturity, you start rebalancing out of riskier instruments into less low risky, uh, low risk instruments. Okay. 
Okay. And finally, uh, you know, before we uh, let you go, could you tell us a bit about asset allocation rebalancing as well and how can investors do it themselves? Well, you know, fundamentally, very it's very simple, really. It's not something that you have to do on a daily basis. Uh, but let's say, uh, you know, we can continue with the example that we just discussed previously, uh, that let's say you have a 10-year uh, investment horizon and uh, your asset allocation is 80-20 to start with. Uh, in, in a rally like this where markets move suddenly have, uh, you know, given a 30-40% return, what may happen is that your equity portfolio uh, uh, the the ratio may shift away from 80 20 to let's say you know 90 10 because of uh, uh, you know growth uh, faster growth in the equity markets so in such a scenario what uh, what rebalancing would mean is it's not that you have to sell your equity portfolio and buy into debt but what you can do is look at slowly increasing the allocation uh, for the next few months into debt so that you have more investments uh, going through into debt and such so that you reach a 80 20 uh, asset allocation over the next six months or so i mean i'm just uh, you know uh, as an illustration similarly if the markets is moving if the markets are moving in a manner that uh, you know there is a correction in the equity market so your equity uh, allocation will become lower in your overall portfolio and let's say you know it moves to 70 30 uh, where 70 is equity and 30 is debt in such a scenario you could look at you know, increasing the allocation on an ongoing basis for your further investments into debt, uh, into equity, so that more of your investments go into equity, such that over a six month period or a, a you know, whatever, you know, investment horizon, your overall investment uh, portfolio, the asset allocation comes back to 1820. So this is the, you know, this is a simple principle which uh, you can use to, uh, sort of implement and rebalance your portfolio based on your target asset allocation. Okay, fair point. Mr. Sanya, it's been great chatting with you about a host of things uh, outside and inside of uh, the Heinstein Report. Thank you so much once again for joining us on The Money Show this evening. Thank you, Karan. Stepping into Thank a break much. once again, uh, more updates and more personal finance uh, related discussions await you on the other side. Stay tuned.